Bob and Fran German, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us, Holly. Yeah, so we've been chatting a little bit before I turned on the recorder, and I, and I have to say I'm totally in love with you guys already, and <laughs> I, I, I want you to adopt me and my kids, and I want you to I want you to be our our, our parents and grandparents. Um, and apparently, we don't live that far away, so it's actually it's actually possible. That would work. You're always welcome, Howie. I good, feel, good uh, plant-based meal anytime. I feel it. I feel it. So, so given <laughs> given that now we're related, it bothers me that I don't, I don't know anything about you. So, who who would like to kind of just go first and just introduce yourselves and like your journey and sure. where you've been and where you are? Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start. I guess uh, we're Bob and Fran German. We're both uh, now uh, octogenarians, both uh, in our eighties. This week, Bob caught up to me. He turned 82. Okay. Yeah. So Fran is a little older than me. Three months. We were, uh, were both from Chicago, and uh, we met at college at uh, Indiana University. And uh, we've had a great life together. We've had... Uh, we are having a great life. <laughs> yeah. We have, like, this adventurous <laughs> spirit. We have been able to travel to over 75 countries. Uh, we always, when we travel, we go off the beaten path and we've met wisdom teachers from around the world. And a, a lot of that knowledge we try to put into our lives. We try to be examples to our children. We have three children and four grandchildren. And uh, we, uh, we live a happy life and a healthy life. Now, I will say there were some hurdles along the way, and maybe Fran could uh, tell us a little bit about one of those hurdles. For sure. Okay. Yeah, well, so before, we before met we... when we were, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Howie? sorry. Before we get there, I just want to kind of follow, follow up. I'm trying to do the math a sure. little bit. So if you're in your still, you know, sort of early 80s, um, you were you were born in the late thirties, early forties, nineteen forty. Um, which kind of like were are you on the cusp like early hippie generation? Like the idea of going to traveling and finding you know wisdom teachers from you know non Western traditions feels to me very Ram Dass and and George Harrison. So I'm wondering like was that was that the thing or did you grow up so you know Midwestern Americana, like what, what opened up for you to like become early explorers of, you know, non-Western thought? Well, I think we started out pretty traditional. Our first trip was one of those, we called it a pajama tour, seven countries in two weeks, never had time to get dressed. <laughs> and that just gave us a little flavor of, but that was, that was like in Europe. It wasn't until uh, we went started going to Thailand yeah. every winter that we really got into um, but, but I think, more Eastern. Yeah, I think more to Howie's uh, question. I think we were pretty traditional through the oh, 50s and, and the 60s. And uh, we never, I don't think we were hippie-like. Not really. at all, not at but, all. But uh, I think there was a time when we 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 decided to uh sort of change course so we we are we started our lives in chicago it got way too cold in chicago so we moved to fort lauderdale area it got way too hot in florida so we came halfway back and we're here in uh, western north carolina so we're called halfbacks <laughs> but I think our lives changed when uh, when Fran became ill. She she got sick in, in what? 19... 1992. Yeah. So we were pretty traditional. We had a we were very traditional. Yeah, and uh, we we didn't we we realized how much life is so important and precious because of illness. Yeah. I think a lot of people take things for granted yeah. until something strikes them and then they have to rethink things. 
Uh -huh. um, and so before before the illness, to... you were you were sort of eating yeah. a standard diet and and living sort of. Oh, a... yeah. oh, we thought we were eating really healthy. Uh -huh. <laughs> we didn't know any better. Uh huh. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, we never gave it any thought. Right. right. Okay. And so so. But then um, in 1992, we went to China for three weeks on a tour. Hmm. We both got very bad viruses while we were there, high fever, and uh, we recovered. We had, um, not viruses, I guess, because we did have, doctor did give us an antibiotic. But when we returned home, several weeks after we returned home, I started experiencing some strange things happening. So I don't know if my, because my resistance was worn down by the trip and the illness, but that's when things changed. Up until then, we were very traditional. We were both realtors in South Florida. We worked hard together. We ate what we thought was healthy, but of course, now we know better. And then our whole life changed one day. Hmm. So what, what was, what was, was it diagnosed or? Well, what happened was I woke up one morning. We were in South, South Florida. I woke up one morning, couldn't open one eye. So I called my doctor. He had us come over to the office right away. He took one look at me and he said, I think you have Bell's palsy. Hmm. And I looked at him and I said, no, I think I have myasthenia gravis. Which I never heard of. Howie, I don't know where that thought came from. I mean, it came out of the blue. Okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah. That, I mean, that sounds like, you know, process. you, you, when you, if someone said that to me, I would think, you know, they've either gone to medical school or are an extreme hypochondriac and spend all day reading the Merck manual. <laughs> well, I, I'm neither. I never was a hypochondriac. Um, I did um, one time when I was student teaching at, uh, in the University of, um, you know, as my senior year, for, I became a teacher, of course, because when you're born in the 40s, women either become nurses or teachers, right? right. So I became a teacher. And I was student teaching and a little boy in the class had myasthenia gravis, which is very unusual because children usually don't get it. So that kind of stuck in my head. Hmm. At any rate, he sent me across the street to the neurologist. The neurologist gave me a, a test, it's called a tinselin test, where he shot something in my arm. My eye popped open and he confirmed that it was myasthenia gravis okay. and put me on prednisone and some other drugs, you know, because drugs are the only way you treat illnesses, right? <laughs> and so, so for let's, 10 years I suffered. Let's have a sidebar and explain to folks what myasthenia gravis is. Okay. First of all, myasthenia gravis is a Greek name meaning extreme muscle weakness. And it's a perfect description because I I was very weak. I couldn't open my eyes. Um, I uh, actually, my, I got very bad double vision. Um, there were times when I couldn't lift my head up off a pillow. I mean, it was just very weak. Slurred speech. Yeah, I couldn't speak well. Yeah. Um, at that time, the only two people I ever heard of who had my gravis was Aristotle Onassis. And it was his eyes mainly. And if you remember Anne Margaret's husband, I can't remember his name right now. He always, was an actor. Always too young for that. No, he knows who Anne Margaret is. <laughs> she was the and she was the one in the in the, the beach movies, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was my only <laughs> reference to people having the disease. Now here I am in South Florida, in a three county area with millions of people. I never met another myasthenic. Hmm. Okay, then. We moved to a small town in Western North Carolina in 2003. And Bob notices in the local newspaper that there's a myasthenia gravis support group at the local hospital, which is, was really strange. And we started going to those meetings. Okay? I, I, I will say this, that Fran, when she first got the disease, we together visited 11 different uh, neurologists over the period of years around the country. And they all said the same thing. Oh, yes. You'll never get better. You'll have to be on medication the rest of your life and you will die 
younger than you know your expected life expectancy. So okay, these were very negative. I call them nocebos mm, yeah. <laughs> because you're not given any hope. Gotcha. Okay. So so well, here I am in the small. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep poking at the story to uh, to draw things out. We'll we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Um, the other, you know, the other, when you talked about, like, you guys were very sort of traditional, even though you thought you were being healthy. Now, having read your book, 101 Ways to Be Young at Any Age, it's, there's a ton about sort of mental state and positivity and fitness and just, you know, just getting on the, the call with you this morning, you guys, like, things are great. We're, we're alive. Like, there's this, this, you know. It, it feels like a practiced positivity, like it's a practice as opposed to you guys were just born, you know, full of sunshine. And I'm wondering, as you as you look back on those years of, you know, being mainstream and being, you know, hard driving realtors, were, were there as you look back, were there sort of habits of mind that you think contrib may have contributed to the illness? OK, well, one thing I wanted to inject is that when we went to China, we learned about Qigong for the first time. So we, and so we started practicing that mm. when we came home. But we were all we were interested. Uh, I don't know. I you know, that's a hard question. I can't put my finger on any time in my life that we started thinking this positive way, we always felt we had choices and we could, we could get up in the morning and say, oh man, another day, or we could get up in the morning and feel great. Say, oh man, another day. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think that the illness again had a big play and really changed our lives. And we had a choice. We could cave in to this disease or we could make changes we could take control of our own health because these neurologists and fancy doctors that we saw did not give us any hope. So we just made it our own personal practice to try to keep calm, try to not overreact to situations and try to deal with life, process life as it, as it came about, not wishing that it wasn't that way but accepting it and dealing with it it was a matter of acceptance mm. now uh that so I well think... just to give you an example here we are going to these support group meetings every month seeing a lot of really sick people of course they were serving wonderful snacks like cookies and chips and mm. soft drinks you know totally unaware that what you eat affects your health. Then one month they had a speaker come from Asheville, a, a dietitian who explained with the use of a slide projector, how even eating something as innocuous as white meat chicken can compromise the immune system. And he recommended that we, that all of us, you know, in the group, stop eating any animal products. He recommended reading Diet for a New America by John Robbins mm -hmm. and um, the China Study by T. Colin Campbell. I immediately got both books, read them cover to cover, and changed my diet. Now, we had become friends with several people in the group over the years. And I have to say, I was the only one who took his advice. And within the next year or two, all of the people who I was friendly with in the group had died, not from myasthenia gravis, but from heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. Because obviously, when your body breaks down, it doesn't just break down with one thing everything kind of goes, you know, bad. And so they were all very, very sick. Mm. Um, I wanna, they all I'll, died. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to come back to that. But you guys used a word, acceptance, that I know that I have been very confused about. And a lot of people are very confused about when it comes to mindset. And, and for a lot of people, acceptance means giving up. Right? Like, oh, I, I you know, if 
and they don't want to do it. They don't want to accept what's happening because it would feel like capitulation. And you, you said we had to accept the situation in order to proactively take, deal, with deal with it and take control. Yeah. And I'm curious yeah, about, like, I'd like you to kind of expand on acceptance as an empowering move rather than a disempowering one. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try. So here we were, we had pretty, we were all, we were pretty healthy. And Fran comes down with this devastating disease. She can't, I couldn't. I couldn't I, work anymore. She couldn't work. I I, she, when she spoke, I couldn't even understand her. The speech was slurred. So these, all these bad things happened. So we had a choice here. Do we, do we just, you know, just, just <laughs> say, well, geez, our life is wrecked now. And uh, we just have to uh, follow what the doctors say. And, um, and, and our lives have changed. Or we could say, okay, this is what it is. This is what, our, the hand we were dealt. Now we got to make the best of it. And now we're we're going to make this negative into a positive. So we do our best to change, to go with the flow of life, to accept this hand we were dealt, and maybe not say, "Oh, we'll we'll accept it," but it's it's miserable. No. We accept it because it was just a fact. It was the reality of life. It was the truth. Mm. So a lot of people deny the truth. It is what it is. And so we said, okay, let's make some changes. Let's deal with this in the best way we can. Well, so we started making changes okay. in our diet, but we also said it's more than just physical. So we started going into a mindfulness practice. We start uh, uh, entertaining Buddhist thoughts and learning from that. And so it was this mind-body connection that that really yeah. put but, us on the right track. But something else happened because I couldn't work. And fortunately, we'd always been very frugal. We were able to retire. Yeah. and start traveling and uh well you were you I were traveling as you were traveling while you were suffering with the myasthenia gravis that sounds exactly. that sounds like a gargantuan task like when i'm tired well, i don't want to get out of basically, bed basically we were taking cruises at first which is a very easy okay. way to travel uh -huh. okay but then, but then we, we got out on our own. We did a lot of, a lot of it on our own as France started to get more active and more healthy. So we started, when Fran was very sick, we started walking maybe just down the driveway to yeah. the mailbox. We'd walk early in the morning when it was cooler and, then and we, my strength was better. And then as she got stronger, we expanded the physical activity and, uh, we got into more of the mental aspect of trying to uh, do our best to keep a, a calm mind and a, a clear head. Yeah, and another thing, because myasthenia is affected by heat, we didn't, we couldn't stay in South Florida in the summertime. It was just way too hot. So we started going to Stowe, Vermont, which is nice and cool in the mountains and just Next door to where we were staying was a resort, and there was a man teaching Tai Chi. Ah. And so we started learning Tai Chi, and that helped a great deal with, with my health. Yes. We yes. still practice it every day. Every day. Mm. All right, so, so you... Have we confused? Have we confused you, Holly? <laughs> oh, it doesn't take much. I'm just trying to get the, t the timeline. So... <laughs> so it's sort of in the, in the 90s at some point you came down with the, with the disease. It sounds like you spent several years sort of on, like on the prednisone, just sort of searching for solutions. And then I know the China study didn't come out until late 2004. So there, yeah. it's like a decade uh, in the wilderness there where you're just sort of casting about well, for solutions. For 14 years. 14 yeah, years. I, had, I suffered with my senior for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Um it wasn't until we moved, like I said, to to um, North Carolina, and I met this dietitian who put me on the path to a plant-based diet, 
that I really started getting better. So what? So tell that story. Like what? What did? What were the changes you made, and how did you notice improvement? Like what was it? Sort of overnight oh, I, I can or say that subtle? We, yeah, I think uh, Fran was like an average cook. No, we, I was a terrible cook. We thought we were eating healthy because we were eating salmon, we were eating white meat chicken, we were eating it was turkey. Boring. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, it was pretty. It was just very uh, average food, I guess. But then she decided to make cooking a hobby well, when instead COVID, of a yeah, chore. When COVID came in and, you know, we well, were kind jumping of, ahead. Yeah, I know, but I didn't really become a good cook until the last four years. <laughs> oh, I think you have. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, what happened was, you know, when we, when we did learn about the diet, we did switch completely to off of all animal products. And, but I, it was funny because I really wasn't feeling that great at first. And I had the good fortune to visit my son in California and he took me to his plant-based doctor who was the first uh, plant-based doctor in Southern California. And he explained that prednisone had shut down my adrenal glands. Mm. And so he said, before you can really start to feel better, we have to build up your adrenals. Mm. And he did that with, um, I think it was vitamin B5. And then he took me off the prednisone very slowly because when you go off prednisone, I mean, you get a rebound if you don't do it mm. properly. Now that's a, that's a steroid, really right? really sick at first. Pred oh, yes. Uh -huh. I was on it for 14 years, okay. so, among other drugs. Uh -huh. But you know, doctors basically just want to give drugs. They don't talk about diet. <laughs> right. So, so you so you took a vitamin supplement, and then what? The, like when you when you heard when you read the China study and Diet for a New America, you did you you sort of switched overnight. Well, here's what yeah. I, here's what literally I, there was another impetus here. Oh yeah, <laughs> I I was uh, I took up race walking as a hobby, and I was working out with uh, women who were actually uh, Olympic hopefuls in the sport of race walking. So that's that exaggerated heel to toe walk, and I'm you're pumping your arms, and I could walk faster than most people. We're jogging or running. And I would do maybe eight or 10 miles a day. And I took the same path every time. Then one day I said, I'm switching paths. And I start going on a different surface, run, uh, w walking that way. And I developed a pain in my groin. And uh, I went to a urologist because I was concerned. He checked me out. He said, I can't, I can't find anything down there. And he said, but let's do a CAT scan and see what's up. So he did a CAT scan and long story short, he pulled, talks, took me in his office and he said, I think you just pulled a muscle in your groin area, but take a look at this. So he shows me on the screen and X, the sort of the X-ray uh, of my kidney, my left kidney had a growth on it. Mm. And he said, that doesn't look good to me and you need to have that removed quickly. And he said, I'm not qualified to do that. So I wound up going to a major uh, international hospital in the state of uh, North Carolina, closer to you, uh, where you live, uh, Howie. And I had a cryoablation surgery to remove this growth. That means they froze it off and they brought in equipment from some other state and I had a specialist who was only one of two people that could do this type of surgery at the time. And he came back and told me that, you know, we, we, we got it all. You know, the famous, we got it all. <laughs> he said, but he warned me, he said, uh, and, and it was diagnosed as cancer. It was a, it was a malignant uh, uh, tumor renal cell carcinoma. So I was in shock. I actually had him repeat that three times when he told me because I couldn't believe I was I was sick. And then uh, I he, he said, 
you know, you have to be a little concerned because this type of cancer can come back, mm. can return. So that trip from the hospital, when I, I spent one day in the hospital, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Fran and I drove home. It was four hour drive and we made a pact to change our life, to, to go totally jump in whole food, plant-based all the way and develop an exercise program and also really get into the mindfulness part of life. And so I'll never forget that conversation because that was life changing mm -hmm. for us. And what, what year and, and month, where, where, when was that? That would be in 19, it was 2006. I mean, uh, 2005 or six, mm. as I recall. Okay. And so it was like, we both, are, <laughs> we looked at each other. We both have illnesses now. And we said, we're not going to accept this. Uh, I mean, we're going to accept this, but we're going to do something about it. And we did. Mm -hmm. Of course, the doctor didn't tell him to change his diet. No, no, not at all. Although a couple of years later, we learned that the doctor changed his diet. Yeah, we, we, that's just a rumor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so what we, we live, we've outlived all of our doctors here <laughs> yeah. in where we live well, now. So and, far for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we just think that we, we, we want to have plants over pills. And we would advise that for anyone watching today to consider that idea. Uh, mm. It's made, it's enhanced our life. We're living the best years of our life now in our eighties. So I think a lot of people, how we have the idea that as you age, you're going to get older and you're going to get sick or you're going to get sicker. And that's not true. So we try to be, I don't want to say role models, but we, we want, we are devoting our lives to spreading the word about having plants as your medicine. And uh, it's worked for us and we live young and we have every day is better than the one before it. Mm. I, I just wanted to tell you that we get a call. I get, well, we both actually get calls from our insurance company regularly begging us to let them send a visiting nurse out to examine us because obviously we're not taking care of ourselves because we are not taking any prescription meds mm. and we're not visiting the doctor every two weeks. Uh huh. <laughs> we don't make many, we don't make any claims. <laughs> Uh huh. You know, for reimbursement. So they got. That's very yeah. sweet. Do you say yes? They actually wanted to give us a gift card. Oh yeah, twenty five dollar gift card to Walmart if her, if we let her come out. <laughs> oh, you totally should. She'll she'll go. She'll, you'll probably convert her. <laughs> That's a good idea. I didn't think of it that way. <laughs> yeah, think how many patients she can help when she. <laughs> Right, because that's that's the problem that when you know when you're in the medical system, which is such a beautiful, great system for dealing with problems that have already happened, and such an inadequate system for preventing those problems in the first place. You know that that so many healthcare providers just never get to see outliers like you, and they you know because they don't. They don't notice them when they when they occur, and they're just you know their job is not to look out for healthy people, right? Just like a beat cop isn't necessarily is, walking also, around you know, looking for law-abiding citizens. Yeah. yeah, and from what I understand, the medical schools are um, financed by the pharmaceutical companies in many cases, so that's where the money is. The pharmaceuticals. Yeah, the mo the model is, you know, just think like plumbers have all the equipment in their truck to unplug your toilet. They don't necessarily have, you know, they don't get house calls from people who are like, my plumbing is perfect. Do you want to just uh, come and look at it? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, you know, that your, your story <laughs> of, of being a, um, a counter example, a counterfactual, um, you know, is, is really powerful.
Um, and like, you know, said like your doctor changed how, how they ate. I don't know if it was due to you or, you know, they lived long enough to gain some insight or wisdom or what, who they tripped over. Um, I'm curious. So yeah. like 2004, <laughs> you guys were still in the thick of it. I think it's like 2005 or six, Bob, you got your re renal cell carcinoma di uh, diagnosis and the, um, the cryo ablation. What is it? Cryo, yeah. Um, yeah. cryo ablation. ablation. Um, I'm curious if, like, if you can discuss like your lives in 2005 versus say 2007, like what was the, like, what was the difference in your experience of life after, after like making the switch to whole food plant-based and positive mindset and yeah. mindfulness and the Qigong and Tai Chi, yeah. like after a year? Yeah, I, I think. Well, we, 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 we have this idea of a happiness scale. So how, how happy are you every day? Are you a six out of 10? Or are you really, really happy? Are you a nine or a 10? And our, our happiness scale, we, we have this sense of relief, even though we have these two illnesses. Uh, we just, we just were forward thinkers. And, uh, we, we never really looked back. It was almost like, you know, the worst years of our life wound up being the most important and the best years of our lives during those times. But we just felt lighter. We were able to do more. And we felt we were on a mission to tell other people about our stories, to spread the word about this. And we, you know, we don't, proselytize. We just try to do this by example. And uh, I think even even our writing the book helps people. We, we get message, we get comments and from all over the world. Every day we get emails and uh, comments on our YouTube from our YouTube channel every day. You've helped me so much. And then yesterday, yeah, tell just me what tell happened yesterday. Quick story where <laughs> every morning we climb a mountain. That's our treadmill. Hmm. So we're not as fast as a lot of people. And some people even run up and down these mountains. I don't know how they do that. So, but we're out there every morning and we're climbing up this mountain and we see two people coming down the mountain at that time. And they looked at us and they said, aren't you that couple on YouTube? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're the couple on YouTube. She's, and they were very serious. You changed our lives. We followed your advice and switched to a whole food plant-based diet. Three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. And we never will, come, will go back to eating meat or dairy products again. We feel more energetic. We, we feel lighter. Our spirit has improved. And, uh, you were great. It was just such a nice feeling for us. Nice way to begin the day. <laughs> yeah. So we're the celebrity of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. lovely. So one thing I wanted to ask about is the, and we'll get to the book and I'll, I'll ask you that challenging question that I mentioned before we started recording. Uh, but you talk about like, you know, not complaining, not judging, um, sort of accepting and looking for the, the bright side. Now, for me, when I went whole food plant based, it was very easy to avoid bad foods. I mean, you know, there was temptation, but it was very clear cut. Like if I'm eating a beautiful salad, I'm not eating a cheeseburger. But in my life, when I have tried to become like really generous with people and non judgmental and not complaining and not snarky and bitchy, those thoughts haven't gone anywhere, right? Like I can still feel them, you know, every day when I read the news, I can feel like, oh, there's a judgment. Oh, that, you know, that person shouldn't have done that. That person shouldn't exist. What an asshole that one is. Like, like it just comes bubbling up. And un unlike with food, it's still inside me and it's something to grapple with. And I'm wondering as you guys made your journey did, you know, did that happen? Did you kind of have to deal with the urges and impulses of old thought patterns or was it like much simpler? 
Like you were just like, okay, we're, we're, we're positive thinkers now. Well, we, we, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think we are always positive thinkers, but, but we must have been, otherwise we would have handled our illnesses differently. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, it was not, for me, it was a, a bit more challenging to go plant-based than it was for Fran. And, uh, you know, I craved certain foods, but <laughs> I, I didn't want to get sick again. So these, these are the life choices and, and that the cravings disappeared. And so I, I, I don't have those cravings they anymore. They do eventually go away. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, as far as what other people do about with their eating habits, I mean, you know, I know you wrote a book that you can change other people. But to be honest with you, we sort of go with the Buddhist thought about you can only change yourself and hopefully people will just watch you and and uh, do kind of follow your path. So if, the, if younger people, we get a surprising amount of uh, letters and comments from younger people. Mm. Oh, I wish my grandparents or my parents were like you, or I want to be like you because I want to live a good long life. And uh, we, we just don't think we can change other people. We can't force them to eat plants. And so if they, and that includes our own family and our own friends. And so if they eat in another way, we, that's their choice. But we, we try to just live an exemplary life. And, and now uh, and then it does make a difference. Yeah. So but just like we changed after we heard the dietitian speak, we were ready to change. The others weren't. And I think that's true in all instances. If a person's not ready, they're not going to change. Right. I'm curious, have you, have but you, I, if I hadn't been, yeah, go ahead. You know, if I hadn't been made aware of this, then I never would have changed because I didn't know any better. Right. All right. So I'm curious, those 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 first people, the books, uh, John Robbins and T. Colin Campbell, have you met them? Well, we've interviewed, uh, well, uh, wasn't Esselstyn part of the, uh, well, he was the Forks Over Knives. We've written uh, and been interviewed with, we've written articles uh, for, their, for them and uh, have interviewed some of them with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know them. Not in particular. We don't know yeah. them personally. Okay. I wish we we could. Uh -huh. We could thank them in person. <laughs> right, because you know they're, you know, all the people that you've helped are sort of their grandchildren in a, in a certain way, right? Yeah. Like if you know, if they're your sort of, got you know, whole food plant based parents, they're the ones who taught you that you're you're a big part yeah. of them spreading the message and and spreading the we have a lot of people that call us uncle bob and <laughs> friend uh -huh. we don't know these people but they feel connected and we feel honored that they are connected we feel we're doing some good All right speaking of doing good um you have uh was it bob and fran .com? Is, mm -hmm. that, is that right it's a yeah, that's our website. Um, and that's, that's you said, you're talking about a, a project to abolish child trafficking. Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit about I that? Can speak to that if you like. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, when we start traveling and Fran, Fran was feeling a little better, we start uh, going to Thailand. We were teaching a Qigong class uh, in, locally and a friend of ours put us on to a place in, China, in uh, Thailand, uh, a town called Chiang Mai, Thailand, in northern Thailand. Well, we wound up spending, we, we absolutely, I mean, the first time we started, we got there from the airport. It just felt. This energy was incredible. It almost knocked us over. And we said, this place is like resonating with us. 
to the highest possible degree. And we, as we walked to find our, <laughs> our lodging and, uh, we could we walked, literally walk to 30 vegetarian restaurants, but we, <laughs> we, uh, we really, uh, we, we wound up going back for nine straight years. Every winter. We spent uh, our visa time, our, our, ni Eight, our 90, 90 days. days in Thailand and uh, another 30 days or so in a neighboring, in, country, in a neighboring yeah. country. So when we were in Thailand, we fell in love with Buddhism. We fell in love with the people. We fell in love with the culture. These were the friendliest, brightest people we've ever met. And we saw poverty like we, we never saw in our lives before. People think that there's poor people in America, which there are, but, but the poverty in some of these uh, rural areas in, uh, in Thailand. In Northern Thailand near the border because okay. these people are not citizens. So they don't have any rights. They don't have medical insurance, you know, health insurance or education. So, so they're, they're, they're vulnerable people. Mm. So they're vulnerable to human trafficking. So we learned a lot about human trafficking, how people were so poor that they would sell an 11 year old girl to a life in a brothel for maybe about nine hundred dollars at the at, at that time, I think, as it was. It's about that, about a thousand dollars now. So the rest of the family could survive. survive for a year or so. The daughter knows it, and the mother knows it, and it goes on. They're also so they're also so this whole idea of child trafficking was just abhorrent to us, and we said. We accepted it because it was real, but we wanted to do something about it. So we uh, we started getting into it, and uh, we went into those villages, and uh, we 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 concluded that the way to stop this, or at least in some curb way it, yeah. curb it, would be to educate these girls and to get medical supplies to to these villages, villages yeah. and that. So we undertook that as a project and we still every for every book sale we make or in any any income that we make uh we we don't we give it right to fighting this uh this uh, uh trafficking of young children what what's the link between education medical care and resilience against trafficking well, if if you if you are not educated, you 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 your life would be as a as the parents would be, and that would be working in the rice fields. And I'm talking about northern Thailand and southern Burma, or Myanmar, and so there's no future, there's no hope. Mm. If you are educated, you can get a job. And usually it's in the tourism business because of, you know, that's what's so popular there. Mm -hmm. You, because we have seen these girls grow as they're educated. And even some of them now Go have gone on to college. Yeah. Some of them have very good jobs. They can speak English. And they're very bright when given the opportunity to get educated. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, I have very limited knowledge about human trafficking, but I imagine that that's also the tourism industry. Well, there's something called sex, sex tourism. tourism. We see it all the time where men, especially, uh, well, I, we've seen a lot of American men and a lot the of Korean, Koreans. Japanese. They, they would come with their golf clubs and they would play golf all day. And then they would want young women at night. And every, you know, it, that, was, that was easy to get. And so... They, these these women were in brothels in larger cities. They wouldn't go. It, these rural areas were the breeding grounds for these for the uh, traffickers. Yeah. So they would bring these girls into brothels in in say Bangkok or Chiang Mai, and uh, 
the sex tourists that these are the girls who yeah. they were with in the evening. So they were playing golf, they were living a high life, having these fancy meals, and then they have these young children. Children. Yeah. We've seen a two year old in a brothel. Good God. This is, you know, it's, it's totally horrific. See, so there was a time when the drug trade was very big on the border, the opium trade. But then the drug traffickers learned you can only sell drugs once, but you could sell a girl multiple times. Over and over. Much more profitable. So they switched to human trafficking mm. from drug trafficking. So the education part is important. It just gives them a, a chance for a career and a life. Yeah. And the medical, I mean, the medical was just just to, just to keep the, them healthy. Yeah, just to keep people healthy. Yeah. Not this, the parents. I mean, we actually had to teach kids how to brush their teeth. Yeah. They never had the opportunity to learn that. I mean, yeah. these are really poor villages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No toilets, no running water, no running water. It's, it's very bad. So, so when you say the money goes to this, is that like you guys going there every year and presenting the education or are there we other organizations to, but, yeah. that you yeah. now we, fund? Yeah, we used to now. Now we're, we're, it was very rough on us physically to uh, travel into these rural areas. Well, not only that, but the 25 hour flight. Yeah, to, to for us. So, but here. we have people on the ground now that are doing the work it's mainly to enhance the life of these villagers to enrich their lives in some way and it's education is the key and medical supplies is also very important but there are little projects of bringing water in building toilets so all of that plays a plays a part mm -hmm. and when we talk about building a toilet we're just talking about we're not talking about you know flush toilets right. like we have here it's just a place to go to the yeah, toilet. You know, ceramic bowl. Yeah. yeah, that's a very big need and it still is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm realizing that whether I meant to or not, the reason that I wanted to bring this up now is that when somebody reads your book, they could easily mistake you guys for like Pollyannas. Like everything's great, the world is wonderful, count your blessings, life is good. <laughs> and it can come across yeah. as, you know, like you guys have this privileged life or you've stuck your head in the sand and you're telling everyone else to be positive. And I'm really glad we, we, we touched on this because you guys have really seen kind of the depths of human suffering and cruelty and, yes. and injustice. And yet you still tell yes. people and you live your lives looking at the positive. And I'm wondering if, can you square that circle for me? <laughs> I really, I, I really never can. really uh, gave it much thought. <laughs> you know, I, I just when we see poor, the poorest of poor people, asking them, asking us to share a meal with them that they prepared, uh, it's just, it, it was just an eye opener. The poor, the, some of the poorest people we've ever seen are, the are happy people. Mm. They they don't walk around with a long face. They're dancing and singing, and the family is so important to them. It, it's a wake-up call. It, wake, it woke us up, I'll yeah. tell you. So uh, I'll, those, that experience in Thailand was uh, another life changer for us. I guess we've been through a few changes <laughs> in our life. We all do. Everyone does. And it's what you do with these these uh, these important factors that that come into your life. It's it's how you deal with them. And when we they, just what's we the expression? Work. You can make lemonade out of lemons. Mm. We do that every day. Yeah. Right. So let's let's get to the book and the you know the the threatening question that I said I was going to ask because the book is called "One Hundred and One Ways to Be Young at Any Age." Most of the chapters are one or two pages you know, snippets. Some of them are recipes. Some of them are Qigong techniques. Some of them are short essays. If you had to pick right. three and, and, and no cheating by saying right. like, oh, I'll pick the one with 25 things, like the letter to my, to my grandchildren. <laughs> like, 
What are the three things that if that, that listeners or, or viewers would would begin to incorporate into their lives? Do you think would you know are are accessible enough to to start with and powerful enough to cascade into the biggest changes? The big one one thing I would recommend in this book we talk a lot about living in the present moment. So that's a very popular phrase. I want to live in the moment. But most people do not live in the moment. Most people are full of anger. A lot of people are full of anger or worry or fear. So a few are holding a grudge. That's one of the chapters in the book. I've come to think of <laughs> yeah, it I about holding a, a grudge. It's like if you're holding a grudge, it's like letting someone live in your head rent free. So it's you're living in the past by thinking of about what this person or what situation made you so angry or upset. So living in the moment means locking your mind into what's going on right here and now, whether you're peeling potatoes, or you're on an interview with a famous guy like Howie, we, you're, we're here right now. But if you let your mind wander into that past, or if you have worries about what's going to happen later in the day, or five years from now, you're not in the moment anymore. You're in another place. You're in the future. So Meditation is a practice or a training for being in the moment. And there are several things about being in the moment and, and meditation in this book. Uh, did you want me to be more specific about a specific uh, chapter? No, 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 uh, no, no need. Open, we can, we can um, you know. Well, I just, I just <laughs> opened to one page. I just opened by accident to uh, page... Uh, well, it's uh, number 26, Article 26. And these are short little articles. One, uh, the one before it is holding a grudge, which we just talked <laughs> mm -hmm. about. And then there's something called a loving kindness meditation. This is like the best meditation you can do because it's good for yourself and it spreads throughout the world, throughout the universe. So... I like I like this one, the loving kindness meditation. Right, can you be a great can you one. Take, take us to take start. us through it a little bit. Okay, a loving my, a kindness meditation means that your mind focus is first on your 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 yourself. That you say to your you say this either out loud or in your in your head. You say, "I am happy. I enjoy inner peace." and I will spread loving kindness throughout the world. And then you, the next step, after you repeat that once or three times or how many you want, you want, then you expand that out to say your immediate family. May my wife and children and grandchildren enjoy inner peace, happiness, and spread loving kindness to everyone they connect with. And then you spread it out to your community. May my friends and my neighbors enjoy inner peace, happiness, and may they spread loving kindness. And then you go out, out, out into the world. What that does is, I think, send some good energy out there to the universe, literally. But I also think that it keeps you focused it just keeps your mind focused on this. This is sort of a long mantra of sorts. It keeps you centered and it keeps you in the moment. And if you train yourself maybe to sit for about 10 minutes, maybe once or twice a day, and just do this meditation, spreading loving kindness, it also helps train you to be in the moment in your, in your life. So that's my example, Holly. Great, and I'm glad I'm glad you shared that because just you know just telling people think positive, and then not giving them a tool, 
is actually yeah. very, in my experience, counterproductive, right? Because then I'm not thinking positive yeah, and then I'm you. judging myself and beating myself up for not thinking positive when in fact the mind is a wild animal with its own ideas. <laughs> And yeah, I, I like that. I, I, I do think that the purpose of our book was to actually give tools. So we even have like a chapter, another chapter I like is just to uh, compliment three people every day. You may not even know, but you walk by somebody, hey, I like, I like that hat you're wearing, guy. You, 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 it looks cool on you. Or you're talking to some customer service person at... <laughs> Uh, HP, HP computers, which I, I seem to do every day, <laughs> but be nice to that person. Or if you get a cold call and you don't, you know, it's, you're, you're sick of these cold calls, understand that these people are trying to make a living. So be nice to them. Hey, I appreciate the call, but I'm not really interested in buying an extended warranty on my car. Don't just hang up on them. It's life changing. It makes them feel good makes you feel better. Mm. So it's a but So Fran, you're on. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I edited the book. He wrote uh -huh. it. <laughs> so another one I like, I just opened to it, is the 35th chapter. It's one, it's three, four paragraphs about being the observer. So I think that you don't have to get in a discussion with people say talking about the two negatives which we love talking about and that's politics and religion but if you see say you're have you're in a family situation and people start disagreeing on things or even if they're arguing about basketball or something mundane or, you don't have to get into that drama you can just sort of be the observer and just see this play as you say you were going to a movie or a theater production and you watch the play unfold you don't have to get involved you don't have to give your opinion mm. every time just be the observer and you'll learn a lot and i think it's good for you just that self-control staying calm not jumping into the mess every time that, that has been so a, that's just another tool. that has been a long lesson for me to learn that the world doesn't need my opinion on everything <laughs> that's right and i'll and i'll i'll raise you one by saying like i'm finding it's also really useful to be the observer in my own head right like mm -hmm. okay when i have thoughts angry thoughts negative thoughts grudge holding judgment um that there's a part of me that's just witnessing those thoughts and they you know they don't have to be acted on they don't have to hurt me i don't even have to take them seriously i go oh look you know there there's the drama like the drama doesn't have to be outside me there can be this whole giant drama in which i am the hero and the victim and the playwright and the critic all at once and i go oh wow that's a fun show <laughs> let me let me go back to my work I think that's accepting you as you, as you yeah. are. It's, it's good. I like it. Great. Never thought of it that oh. way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I have much more drama inside me than I, than I experience in the world. You know, like I feel like if- That's really saying something. <laughs> yeah, like if you could hear all my voices, you'd be like, holy cow, how does that guy get through a day? <laughs> Um, so, I think you're doing pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, you know, it turns it turns out to be a choice and a practice, right? Like I have a forty minute a day meditation practice, and you know, I, I've noticed a huge difference since I adopted it. Just, just like the the world, it feels like I have skin now. Like there were times where it felt like the world touched me, and it was all sort of you know raw nerves. And there was nothing I could do other than mm. like shriek and jump and in reflexive pain. Um, it feels like meditation has grown me some skin. Excellent. Good. One other thing I, 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 I would suggest to people, uh, I don't think I could sit for 40 minutes. I mean, I give you credit. Oh, tw 20 minutes twice a day. That. I don't. 
All right, okay. but but even that is sort of rough yeah. for me. Yeah, but our, our meditation is a moving meditation. Yeah, tai so we, we, we practice Tai Chi, but the easiest thing to do is to take up Qigong. We talk a little bit about that in the book, and we have a, a ton of free Qigong lessons on our YouTube channel. But that is like Fran said, it's sort of a moving meditation that we lead you through. And uh, we think that's just very powerful stuff. It is because if, if you're not really with it, you can get lost. <laughs> yeah, you, you just get lost in space and you don't want to do that. So it, it just makes you, it really aids in concentration, lowering stress levels. And it has this extra dynamic. It's sort of a, a bonus that it increases your energy level. I'm talking Qigong. Mm. That's Q-I-G-O-N-G. -G. You can Google it or you can read about it in our book. Okay. And, and if I wanted to find your YouTube channel, what would I search for? You could just search for Bob and Fran. When you, when you go into YouTube in the search bar, it's Bob and Fran. The name of the channel is Young at Any Age, sort of the, the name of the book as well, Young at Any Age. But uh, the YouTube channel is similar to the book in that we give a lot of tools. We don't just talk about, hey, you got to be positive. We tell you, give you some steps on how to be happy, how to be positive, and uh, how, to, how to live a long life that's a healthy life. And of course, uh, eating a whole food plant-based diet is a key element in that. I, we always come that, back to that because mm -hmm. that, that's our anchor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, Howie, I say that people, most people take better care of their cars than they do of their bodies. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't think of putting something bad in their gas tank, but they put bad things in their mouth every day. Mm. And the lines of, you know, fast food restaurants get longer and longer. But we're making positive. I think we're making strides. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that are, are they're, they're, they're eating more plants well, they, and they, less yeah, meat. Right, absolutely. It's, they used to say that 2% of the population was vegan and now it's 4%. Maybe more in certain countries. In some countries. <laughs> when we were in Germany back, that was our very first trip overseas. All it was was meat, and, you know, huge people and now, Berlin is the number one city in the world for vegan restaurants. Mm. That's pretty cool. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I have, uh, I don't know if you know, um, uh, Michael and Bianca Alexander, they have a, um, a show, I, I can't, I'm not sure, it's, uh, um, it's called Conscious Living TV. And they're, you know, both whole food plant-based vegans who are, you know, into meditation and East, Eastern stuff. And they, they had recently had an episode where they went to Berlin and they're, you know, their, their mission, they're, you know, these vibrant, you know, youngish people just traveling the world as luxury travelers showing you can do it, be healthy and yeah. support important causes. Um, yeah. So they, you know, I, I'm remembering they're, they're, mm -hmm. they went to a nightclub in Berlin. They went to like this pizza, vegan pizza restaurant that has some of the best pizza in the world. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not only possible to like, we think of it like I'm either going to have fun or I'm going to be healthy or I'm either going to have fun or I'm going to be moral, right? Like it was Alexander Wolcott who said, everything I love is either illegal, immoral or fattening. And yet you guys and the Alexanders are living proof that it's not a dichotomy. It's not a forced choice that ultimately right. the things that are good for us are also good for the planet and make us happy. Exactly. So, so it's been so awesome getting to know you guys. Now, now I feel I can just show up. I just give you 10 minutes notice. I can show up for dinner. <laughs> Give us a half okay. hour. <laughs> I, I want you to come to our house for dinner, you and your wife. There's a, a small charge, but it's worth yeah. it. Howie, <laughs> <No. laughs> oh, yeah, I, I did want to say I, I thank you for talking a little bit about our book. Uh, I think it's on sale, by the way, at Amazon. 
and all the money, when we talked about the human trafficking, every dime that comes in from those book sales go to fight human trafficking. So we would ask any of the viewers to think about that. Maybe check out our YouTube channel, try some Qigong. And uh, we, we, we just appreciate your having us as guests. Well, it's been, it's been an honor. And just to, to help people find you. So the book is called 101, that's 101, the numbers, Ways to Be Young at Any Age. Your YouTube channel is called Young at Any Age, and by people can find it by searching for Bob and Fran. And you have a website, a couple of websites. Well, right. We our main website is uh, uh, Bob and Bob and Fran. B O B N is in Nancy Fran dot com. We have a lot of uh, good recipes on there. A lot of Fran's personal recipes and. Uh, references uh, for people that uh, want to live a young life. Uh, from that uh, website, you can check our human trafficking website out as well. There's a link on our main website if you're interested in the child trafficking part of things. Excellent, excellent. Because you know, I, yes. I've coached a lot of people on getting healthy. And when they start, they're like where you were, like, I want to not get cancer again. I want to overcome a disease. And at a certain point, when they start feeling healthy, the question comes up, what do I want to do with this health? Right, like what kind, what kind of life do I want? What kind of positive contribution do I want to make? So I love mm -hmm. the connection between, okay, we're vibrant, we're energetic, we're, we're young at whatever age we happen to be, and we're going to put a lot of that energy into making a positive difference in the world. I just, I just adore that. that. That's the key. I think service to others is the highest form of living. And uh, we would, I mean, it's easy to, to do that. There are so many organizations that need volunteers, especially these days. Uh, that's one, one way you can help other people and help yourself as well get out there and volunteer, or just decide to do some good deeds for people, maybe connect with people that are in your realm of friends who are ill or need some help, reach out, do something, help them. It's, it's good for everybody. Beautiful. Cool. Well, Bob and Fran German, thank you so much for all the work you do, for being such beautiful role models and for taking the time with me today. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Howie. We, we appreciate, appreciate it. Very grateful to have us on. And, uh, and remember, you got to give us a half hour warning if you're coming for dinner. OK, well, as long as I have cell service in Asheville, I can do that. <laughs> right. I, I want to leave you with one closing uh, that uh, I was thinking about as I talked to you. Uh, and uh, it is our, our personal goal in life is to die young, die young as late as possible. Yeah. So think about that. And uh, we, we appreciate uh, all of you that are viewing us in this interview. And Howie, thanks again very much. Oh, my, my absolute Namaste. pleasure. Be well.